Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. I have one of my favorite guests. Yay. She has been on the show a couple of times, and she is back to talk about her new book, the one and only Joanna Angel. Hi, Holly. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing good. Doing good. I like your little background that you got set up there. You got like a little black background with like some yes, yes. It's lights. Like, it's like recycled Christmas lights that I did had some fun with. Do you I use have, that just for like for like your little interviews and stuff like that? I have been doing my interviews here, which is kind of silly because I wind up always wearing black. So I don't know if I'm just disappearing into the background. You're just like um, a floating head. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I guess I didn't really think too much about that. Um, but uh, yeah, I have been doing my interviews here, and sometimes I do like webcamming and, and stuff here. Yeah, because I uh, to set up a light today. Can you see me okay? I can see you. Okay. Yeah. That's okay. I, I like being a floating head anyway. <laughs> <laughs> here, I'll roll um, my sleeves up, then you can see some body there, parts. You know, Joanna, yeah. just take your clothes off, and then yeah, we'll I'm be fine. Gonna, I mean, I'll take my clothes. <laughs> Off, you know, if you want, I feel very comfortable like that. Um, Unfortunately, I don't think YouTube would approve. Yeah, yeah they definitely would. They barely approve of of me with clothes on. So, <laughs> this is true. This is true. Um, speaking of clothes off, you got new boobs. I did get new boobs. I mean, they're a year old now, but uh, but yeah, I guess they're new to the world since uh, this since last year didn't really count. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I got them uh, last February, actually. And you love them? I love them. Yes. Yeah, I really love them. What made you, because you had, you know, you natural boobs for a long time. What made you to finally decide to make the to switch? Do it? You know, it was just, and I always really loved my boobs. I didn't have a problem with them. I didn't think something was wrong with them. Um, but, you know, I did when I was younger, younger, I actually had like, like D boobs, um, you know, uh, which I think sometimes you can just naturally have when you're younger. And then, mm. then as I got older, you know, like working out, losing weight, when you have natural boobs, they fluctuate so much. Um, and then I always did find that I was trying to make my, my C cups look like D cups and clothes, you know, so with, with padding and squishing and cleavage and whatever. So I, like, I was never like a small boob girl. Like that's a certain look, you know, um, I actually was in some like big natural boob movies in the early start of my porn career when they were much larger. I think, uh, it was a different strain of birth control I was on or something. I, I don't know what it was. Um, <laughs> Or my, my luck in my early 20s where I could have giant boobs and never gain a pound, you know? <laughs> um, I remember those days. I not know. the giant boob part, but the <laughs> But, um, I, you know, I don't know. I, I think I was, just, I was just looking at my body and being like, the, uh, big boobs make sense on me. And I, I kind of wanted to change. Kind of wanted to, like, walk gracefully into the cougar milf section of porn. I was just going to ask, were you just like embracing your milfness? Yeah, your milf I guess, yeah, it made me feel like more uh, womanly or something. And I, I don't know, you know, I, I sometimes people really like over philosophize this, like, yeah, this is my body and blah, blah, blah. Like, I don't know. There was no real like deep meaning behind it. Like I just wanted big tits and I was uh, <laughs> in a place in my life where, um, uh, I, I was able to get them. Um, so I was like, why not? And it was, I didn't have that much pushback. I mean, I also didn't tell that many people, you know, mm -hmm. but, um, I like, it wasn't like I was really killing it in the like natural boob category, you know, yeah. it's not like that's what I was known for, you know? Yeah. Um, so it wasn't really like, you know, it just became a matter of a little while, just finding the right time to schedule it, you know, cause you need, you need downtime and then, you know, just, uh, finding the right doctor and stuff like that. But, uh, yeah. Uh, you know, with, with a person who always got tattoos, like I never found like modifications to really be that big of a deal, you know, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> nor am I scared of them. I don't know. Like some people, which maybe is a good idea are just like overly cautious with any modification they do, whether it's a tattoo, whether it's plastic surgery or, you know, and like, obviously mm -hmm. like, like I'm not going to go to like, um, Tijuana or something to get a boob job. But like, I don't know. I, I was pretty like, pretty, uh, 
like whatever, you know, I want big boobs. If they turn out like a little bit fucked up, I'll get them fixed. I don't know. No big deal. I've never been one of those people that's like so super neurotic over that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I'm very happy with how they turn out. I think they're great. And the whole process was super, super easy and fun. I mean, you know, getting elective surgeries is fun. Yeah. yeah. Well, and you definitely had downtime this year. I, I might know. have. And literally the, the day that they were healed, I guess, like the day that I was like, hey, I, I think I'm ready to, to start shooting again was two days before the shutdown happened. So it's pretty <laughs> funny. So my boobs definitely had time to settle. They had more than enough time to settle. <laughs> yeah. I might be hitting you up for a recommendation because I think by the time I'm Ooh. done breastfeeding. You're going to want some uh, enhancements. They're, let's just say that they aren't going to look the same. They're not going to bounce back to the pre-baby perkiness. It's just not. No, I'm not 20 years old. Right. You know what I mean? I get it. Well, just, you, should, you should do what makes you happy. We're going to try to squirt out another one first and then maybe do Ooh, that. Oh, another baby. Yeah. Wow. I figured. Why Good not? for you. Get Good it over you. with. Yeah. I don't have a lot of time too, so. I, I understand. But there's, you know, there's never a right or wrong time for a baby, right? Yeah. You make it work, yeah. you know? This is, this is true. Though, as you know, as you know, getting older your biological clocks. No, I know. That's that's the clock you have to pay attention to. Everything else can so be so unfair. Over. I know, I know. I hey, I I feel the same way. So I yeah. understand. <laughs> but anyways, enough about boobs and babies. Let's talk about your book. Let's talk about my book. Another so, B. Yeah. So last time we spoke, which was, I believe, like a little mini interview at the Adult Time booth at AVN. Oh, what was that? And then we, we did one during quarantine, too. Oh, yeah, yeah. We did the live thing with you yeah, and with Small Hand. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so you kind of were talking a little bit about the book. And so I knew that you yeah. were working on it. At that and point, I was working on it. Yeah. And now you finally come out with it. It's called Club 42. Mm -hmm. And it's a choose your own adventure story about a girl who starts working at a strip club. Yes. Yes, it is. So tell us a little bit about what inspired your idea for this. Well, um, you know, I've, I have really been wanting to write a book about stripping for quite some time. Um, I think it's a really... I have spent a lot of time at strip clubs um, over the years. Feature dancing and actually before... I, I mean, I started my sex work really at a strip club and I, I really, I really found myself and I had a lot of real like life changing self discovery happen, um, at strip clubs, uh, the early, early days of, of burning angel. I mean, I guess I was technically in the porn industry, but not really, you know, cause the mm. beginning of my career is so unique. You know, I was living in New Jersey. I, you know, I had my own website. I wasn't even doing like videos yet. I mean, you know, the whole beginning of of Burning Angel, everybody could catch you up on it. You had done your uh, first epic anal scene with Tommy Pistol. Yeah, yet. I hadn't even done it yet. But uh, there was like this interim where like Burning Angel was taking up, you know, which Burning Angel was my my passion and my life. And like I was putting everything I had into it. However, it was not making, you know, money. <laughs> like, it was making OnlyFans money. <laughs> and it was, yeah, definitely not OnlyFans money. I mean, it was not making money to, to put into the company and pay myself to live, you know? Yeah. Um, and for a while I was working at like a restaurant. Um, and then I was kind of working as like a receptionist at like a hair salon for a little while. And then I don't know, one of the burning angel girls that we shot very early on and she was a friend of mine and just in photos, photos, uh, the early days of burning angel was just pictures the first couple of years, which was very funny. A lot, not a lot of people know that. Um, anyway, she had told me that she just started working at a strip club and I was like, Oh, I mean, I had never been to a strip club. I mean, this was, this was just such a different time, you know, like, mm. I just feel like everything is so accepted and open and, and available to, to, to people now about sex work, you know, like it wouldn't be the most absurd thing for like someone in college to just like audition at a strip club. Whereas back then it was, it was strange, you know? Mm -hmm. um, anyway, she told me she was working there and she was like telling me how much money she was making and how much she loved it. And uh, 
you know, um, and she happened to actually also be like in a band and she was talking about how great it was with her schedule because she could work when she was home and then she could take off whenever she wanted, you know, and I was like, oh, this actually sounds great because I really need to to focus on Burning Angel, you know, and then I can work somewhere else, you know, as little or as much as I want to bring in money and, you know, working at night so I could kind of work on Burning Angel things during the day. I don't know. It just seemed to make sense. And uh, um, one night I just went and tried it. And um, so it's kind of funny because my first few years of Burning Angel, I, I was like supporting my struggling porn site with money I made at a strip club, <laughs> <laughs> which was <laughs> kind of silly. And a lot of the first like kind of big purchases, you know, cameras and even just like stuff in the office and stuff like that. Like, the, you know, when we had a burning angel office, like all these things were paid for by me working at a strip club at night, which is pretty funny. Um, but I, I really, I, I really found myself there. You know, I really like learned a lot about myself. I learned a lot about business, you know, cause you really are kind of, you really are marketing yourself at a strip club. I mean, that that's what you're doing. That's how you make money. You have to, you have to sell yourself. And you know, that's kind of, what I wound up doing in porn when I became, you know, my own brand and, and stuff like that. And, um, I don't know. So I, I guess, I guess I had always wanted to do some writing about stripping and I was never sure how. And, and plus, I just think, um, stripping is, it, strip clubs are, are fascinating places, you know, like, uh, and most people, you know, my, I mean, my thing has been porn and anytime I do press or an interview or I tell my story, I'm telling the story about porn and the porn industry, mm -hmm. which is of course fascinating within itself. But strip clubs are like so much more unique because you know, on a porn set or your life in the porn industry, you go to a porn set and everybody on the porn set is more or less in porn, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of times you're living your life within the porn community and you go to porn events and, and stuff like that. So when you get into porn, you're like in porn. And even though it's very interesting, um, I mean, you know, a day on set is is not that interesting anymore after a while because it, it mm -hmm. just seems like work, even though unique things can happen. Mm -hmm. But a strip club is like a wild card every night. You know, things are very unpredictable. And also you have like half the room is in the sex industry and half the room isn't. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And even the people in the sex industry, they're like in the sex industry, but not really. You know, most strippers go home to a life very outside of anything dealing with sex work. Same mm -hmm. with the management, same with the DJs and, and everything like that. So you just have like this, this mix of so many worlds, you know, in, in one funny place. Um, and it just creates a really good backdrop for, for writing fiction. Um, so... Yeah, I've had some yeah. guests on who have told me some pretty funny stories about their time at the um, at a strip club. I had uh, London River tell me about a time. Oh, yeah, she, that, like, and she still dances sometimes. Well, I don't know. Yeah, after well, time, but yeah. But like a stripper <laughs> peed in her purse, like a competitive stripper. <laughs> so do you do you, do you have any kind of crazy stories like that that like you built your book on? Like how closely related is it to things I, that actually happen to you? So, I, I mean, it is fiction. It's not an autobiography, but there are a lot of things that happen that are fictionalized, you know, and a lot of characters of, of people I knew that I kind of, you know, mm -hmm. put put fake ap attributes to. Um, you know, I did, I actually had, a, I tried to kind of reenact one, one awkward moment I had at the strip club. Also, I tried to keep it, there were a lot of like really crazy, more like, kind of fucked up things that happened. Not yeah, to me not when not I was a stripper, fucked, but, up, fucked up. But like but not not like traumatic or anything, but there was some of course dark times, you know, as a stripper. Yeah. You're staying, you know, there was once for a while I was working in a strip club till six o'clock in the morning in New York City, you know, and it was an interesting time. But I, I couldn't writing erotica is similar to like making porn. There's some things you just can't put in there. You know, like when you're making a porn, you can't really have people depicting like drugs and they can't be like, you know, they have to be able to consent, you know, without being too yeah. under the influence. And like, you know, you got to keep it kind of in this, in this zone where like, it's sort of happy, you know, mm -hmm. I wanted, um, so I, so I didn't get into too many like crazy things. And I, I actually did have a, a big stripper fight happen in the book that, uh, that the editor suggested that I take out. Cause it was a little too, uh, I don't know, you know, not a, not very, uh, 
a little too realistic. Uh, yeah, I, I guess so. But even though I thought it was funny, but um, you know, so I tried to focus on on other things. But um, but something I did when I did work at a strip club, I do remember I had um, which I I changed it a little in the book. I remember I had a regular customer who was like he came to see me all the time, and he was a close friend of mine's father from when I was like growing up. Um, oh, that's weird. Yeah. And he, I, the whole time I always wonder, does he know? I don't, I'd like to, I don't know. Like, did he know or did he not know? Cause this was a friend that I had when I was like in middle school, you know, and I had changed schools after that and I didn't see her, you know, forever. So, and I looked very different, had tattoos, different haircut, whatever. I mean, the last time he had seen me, I was like, how old are you in seventh grade? <laughs> How old, like 12, 13 years old? Something like that. You know? So the last time he had seen me, I was 12 or 13 years old. And this is me at age like 23. But he was a dad. Dads look the same, like from the age of, you know, 40 <laughs> to like 80. You know, like he, that, the, the dad looked the same. So I knew who he was. I don't think he knew who I was. I especially because feel... I used a different name. But mm. I, he would, and he would spend a lot of money on me. And he would stay in the VIP room with me and, and, you know, I, I would like, and also I had moved, you know, to a different, so I lived in a different area. Like I had not seen that girl or her dad in, like I said, over 10 years and between the age of 12 and 22, you change a lot as a person. So, um, but I remember having that be like a thing and I, it would always be like, and, and sometimes the more fucked up part of me, would, you know, I get, I get turned on, you know, like, <laughs> and sometimes I would get like freaked out, you know? But uh, I always wondered, like, does he know and that's why he's doing it or does he not know? And he has no idea. And it's just pure coincidence. But and I, you I never mean, found out. huh? Um, I mean, I know I definitely never said, like, you know what? <laughs> You're Rebecca's dad. <laughs> Remember me? <laughs> Remember when we all went out for ice cream? <laughs> so it was a little more right sexy and lighthearted um where it was her friend's uh like boyfriend in high school or something you mm. know and yeah and it was like a thing where she and she had like a little crush on him in high school but she, you know she didn't tell him her name and like you know the whole time she's giving a dance she's like does he know does he not know and I don't know that I went, so I went into that because I feel like that's something that, you know, if you start dancing in a, in a town close to where you grew up, inevitably that's going to happen at some point, right. you know? Um, so I played with that. I, what I mostly uh, uh, really went into in a certain part of the book, um, which I haven't really delved into before, was there's a whole section of the book where, you know, and like there's a lot of sections of the book because it's choose your own adventure. Right. So there's like, do you want to do this or do you want to do this? And so if you go to the part of the book where she goes, there's a part, a certain section where she goes home and it focuses very much on her home life. Like there's a certain section of the book that very much focuses on the life at, at the strip club. But then there's a part where she goes home and she has to deal with like, do I tell my friends? Do I tell my boyfriend? Do I tell my parents? Like, what do I do? And there's one whole path, like a whole storyline where she chooses not to tell her boyfriend. And this, and in this particular path, I made, I made the boyfriend very douchey too. Um, I don't know. And I, I really tried to kind of focus a lot on like what it's like to, to like your job as a sex worker and also, uh, like be in a relationship and like how to kind of compartmentalize the two, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and, and, you know, I, it's definitely something a lot of people in the industry deal with, you know, and, Hey, I'm sure even though you're not, uh, having sex with anyone on camera, you know, w when you were dating and, or and stuff camera. like that, right? <laughs> when you were, uh, dating people, you know, you've, you've dated, uh, civilians and it's always mm -hmm. like a, a thing. Yeah. Um, so I, I focused on that and that actually was, um, you know, thing that was stuff that I, I had dealt with. So I kind of took a bunch of my old, you know, dating stories and combined them into one story and, 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 uh, you know, played off that. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah. And I don't know, it's a very fun, like New York book. Everything kind of takes place in New York and New York is a very fast paced 
fast moving city. So the book is, you know, like a fast paced uh, book. <laughs> yeah. It's really interesting too, that you made it like a choose your own adventure, which, um, I definitely want to get into that, but before we do, we're going to take a commercial break. So stick around guys. We'll be right back. If you're here, it's probably because you're a fan of my podcast, Holly Randall Unfiltered. Well, that's great because I'm a fan of my podcast too. Now, if you don't know what Patreon is, it's a crowdfunding platform that allows people to make contributions on a monthly basis. Because this podcast costs money to make, maybe even more so than others. I'm obsessed with quality. So since the beginning, I have always recorded in a studio, had a professional sound engineer, and recorded professional video. All of these things cost money, as you can imagine. And I also made a pretty scary decision this year to cut down on my directing gigs so that I could focus more on this podcast, which is why I need your help now more than ever. But don't worry, I'm not asking you to give me something for nothing. In exchange for your contributions, I offer so many perks. For example, access to the live streams of all of my interviews, a bonus podcast that I do called My LA Porn Life, Q and A's where the stars answer your specific questions, behind the scenes interviews, merchandise such as mugs, shirts, and stickers, access to my private Snapchat, and so much more. You can join for as little as $5 a month and help me change the way the world sees the adult industry and sex work. So take a look around and see everything that I have to offer. I really hope that you'll join and be a part of our little community. Guys, thanks for sticking around. We are back. So you did a choose your own adventure and I used to read those kinds of books when I was a kid. There was a time that they were very popular, but I haven't heard about anybody coming out with a choose your own adventure type story in a long time. So the fact that you used that narrative structure and use it in a book about like sex work and stripping, which is something that's, you know, really fun and obviously has a lot of different paths that it could go down. What gave you the idea to do that? And was it hard to write it that way? Did you have a hard time, like kind of keeping track of the different storylines? Um, well, I, I, you know, I feel bad because of course everybody, uh, wants to know how I came up with the idea and it, it was not my idea when I got my uh, book deal from, Cleese, they had suggested it and more like, it wasn't really a suggestion. It was like, it was like, uh, uh, if you want to write a book, it'll look more of like, Hey, we'd love you to write a book and we'd like it to be in this format. It's something we want to do. I think if I would have said no, that book deal would have maybe gone away, but I don't really know. Who knows? Um, Who knows? Because you chose this adventure. I chose this this adventure. Yes. (laughs) <laughs> uh, and now, you know, I, I, this is my second choose your own adventure. Uh, right. Your first so, one, which was night shift, right? Yeah. The first one was night shift and, you know, after it did well. And I actually even asked when they offered me my second book, like, can we make this one just a linear book? And they were like, mm, no, we'd rather <laughs> not. <laughs> love or appreciate it first time around it just it's very challenging it yeah. is really challenging it's very hard to keep track of um you know writing a book it, it's hard enough to come up with a solid idea with a cohesive and exciting beginning middle and end but when you do choose your own adventure you need to think of like several different beginnings, several different middles, several different endings, and then some, you know, and they all kind of have to be interwoven with each other. And, and, you know, you have to make like a, like a book map, not like a book outline. You need like a, a whole crazy. Yeah. Like how did you structure that? Like what, for some reason I've been envisioning like post-it notes. all. Yeah. Over. Yeah. It's, almost, it's like a crime map, you know, like this goes here and this goes here and then, and, and, you know, actually, most of the feedback, I have to say, was was positive of the first book. Um, and I was very thankful for that. However, uh, it's just my personality type to, to focus on the negative. <laughs> and I am a perfectionist. I, I wanted my second book. It had to be better than the first. You know, I always want to mm-hmm. I want to build on what I'm doing and I always want to get better 
at whatever it is that I'm doing. Right. Um, so uh, I, a few people said, by a few, like, I mean, like two, um, a few people said, uh, I like this book. It was fun, but I feel like she didn't uh, embrace the format enough, you know, um, but which is hard to do. And so I was like, OK, OK, I need more adventures in this one. I need more splits. I need more paths. I need it to be more, you know, um, yeah, I just need to embrace it more. So what I actually had in this one that I didn't have in the first one is some uh, like like game over, like dead ends which I think mm. was uh, pretty uh, integral to the choose your own adventure format that I guess I didn't do in the first one. So there's a, a few paths in this one where she gets fired from the strip club and, mm -hmm. and, and like, it's like, I guess the only equivalent of game over. <laughs> You know what? I used to read those books. I used to always like skip forward to the ending to see if it was an ending that I wanted to read through. Oh, you I cheated. You totally cheated. cheated. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I guess this book kind of feels much like those, those DVDs in the, in the two thousands that were popular, the, the interactive ones. Oh you know? yeah. Like if you yeah. want to see this, go to this, it's almost like, it's like an, it's like a porno DVD, you know, because since it is erotica, I mean, you kind of know, like, which yeah. characters are going to lead to which right. type of sex. Right. Or you can get an idea, you know. Right, 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 right. So um, tell us a little bit about some of the adventures that she goes down. Can you give yeah. us a little hint about, like, the different things that she goes through? Some spoilers? Yeah. Well, there's, a, there's many different things that she goes through. So first... Um, she gets her job, uh, at the club and then, yeah, um, in that kind of adventure, there, there's funny, like simple paths you can take. Like, should she dance to hip hop or should she dance to rock or should she dance to R and B or something? And like writing those were really funny for me. I would literally like put on that type of music and, and do like a stripper dance in the room I was writing in and then go back and write. Like, I was like trying to almost like write to the beat of the music and, and really just kind of explain how like you move differently when it's different tempos on stage, right. you do different dance moves and different, mm -hmm. I don't know. It was, and I tried to like read it as I was writing to the length of a song. I don't know. I probably, it was kind of ridiculous to do. So there's, there's different paths like that. Um, there's also a part of the book where she um, chooses or doesn't choose to uh, to become a dominatrix, um, or really, it's not even really. Yeah, I guess I I guess to try being a dominatrix for a night, like she goes to like a, a play party or whatever, and and decides to kind of try this out for her first time. Um, so that was really fun to write, and it's actually very it's very different to write uh, BDSM erotica, you know, because different there's different sensations and different emotions and different, um, different things that, that arouse you in that kind mm -hmm. of setting. Um, so there's that, you know, and then there's, there's a whole path where she has a really wonderful and supportive boyfriend. Um, and then there's a whole path where she has a, a douchey boyfriend that she's like hiding it from. Um, there's definitely, uh, there's a whole path where she gets into a pretty, exciting kind of lesbian relationship with one of the strippers. Um, there's a, there's a path where she, um, where she gets into a relationship with a, or a, a romp, whatever you want to call it, an adventure with a trans woman. So it was really fun to write a uh, trans um, erotica. Um, and uh, yeah, there's just a lot of different, there's like every kind of sex in this book. There's like so many different, types of sex there is boy girl sex there is girl girl sex there's there's actually there's like a bi she's a, she gets into a, like a bi uh threesome at some point with her boyfriend and another dude um you know there's there's like everything in here um and that was how detailed how detailed are the sex scenes they're very i mean it's erotic and they're very detailed uh they're they're uh i mean people are are supposed to to masturbate to this <laughs> <laughs> did you ever like so i had um did you did you find that you had to 
like try to find all of these different ways to name like body parts oh, yeah. and that kind of thing. Because I remember, so I used to date somebody who used to write for AVN and he used to also write like a bunch of those like sex stories and whatever for like high society. Yeah. And he yeah. literally had like a board with different names for penises and vagina, like kind of everywhere. And he would just like pull different, you know, different words. Yeah, no, it is challenging. And, it, and you kind of have to, you have to let go of certain things. You know, I did actually go to school for writing once upon a time and it is something I, you know, tried to perfect over the years. You have to just let, let go of certain things because it's a very big no-no as a writer to repeat yourself. And you, you have mm -hmm. to know you're going to repeat yourself at some point. Like, so right. the actual words to describe the sex, I mean, there are only are so many words. Like the goal is to not come up with 75 different ways to say penis or orgasm or vagina. Yeah. And like you such obtuse words that people have to right. like look them up in a dictionary. Yeah, like you know, that, that's not the goal, but the goal is to always have a unique um setting in which they're happening and also the um i mean the actual uh uh sex positions you know like i mm -hmm. um you you got to make sure they're you know they're fucking in different ways or having different kinds of having different kinds of sex so there there'd be some areas where i'd focus on like okay like this is just an oral sex thing like you know like like she gets thrown on the bed and her boyfriend goes down on her until she comes like crazy. And then that's kind of that. And then, you know, and then in one sex scene, she gets fucked doggy. And in another sex scene in the book, she's, you know, fucked it in a different way. Like, so I mostly just tried to change the actual like things that were happening mm -hmm. rather than try too hard to use different words. Um, I mean, I also have to say, I have to give credit to, to the editor, um, or my, my editor at Cleese, you know, because she is an editor of erotica full time. It was actually very funny because in, a, in my first book that we worked on, I had written, you know, uh, whatever I, I had written a good amount. And then she, had, she had checked in with me at some point, you know, like, Oh, I want to, you know, see what you're doing. Um, because it was the first book I was writing. And, and it was very funny to have this woman who works at a publishing company sits behind a desk totally wears like long floral skirts, has glasses, like your typical, <laughs> your typical like publisher. Like she right. just is, you know, very much so a, an editor, nonetheless, you know, editors, I don't know if you really know many like writing editors, but they, they seem to all have a certain personality type where they, they have to be very kind of like stoic people because it's their job to like, yeah, you know, um, and people who are neurotic about grammar and stuff like that, it's a certain personality type. Anyway, um, it was just so funny, me being the porn star who has sex for a living, <laughs> let alone pretty filthy sex for, you know, what I'm known for, to have her come back to me and be like, we need this dirtier, we need this dirtier. And I was like, excuse me, and seeing, you know, and she did like, like some edits on a certain erotic passage that I wrote and seeing the things that she wrote, I was like, my, oh my, you are freaky, <laughs> lady. <laughs> you are much freakier than me. And I was like, all right, all right. Cause I don't know why I felt like I needed to like tone it down. But you know, these, the, the demographic of women that read erotica, they, they want to see some filth. <laughs> women are very filthy, you know, and it is, yeah. I guess, mostly from what I know, the demographic of people who do read erotic is, is more women um, than men, but who knows? Um, I personally love reading erotica and more so than, than watching porn, because I don't know how you feel about this, but for me, it's like when I read erotica, I get to imagine like what the person looks like. I have more control over the situation. Like my imagination gets to, you know, kind of plug in all of these things that are a turn on for me. But when I watch a porn, well, there's two problems. The first one is, is that obviously like the entire scene and everything that happens has been constructed for me by other people. So I don't get any like person, I don't get to inject my imagination into it. Right. And right. secondly, I fucking know everybody in porn. Well, yeah. Yeah. It's so, like, I can't, I everyone. yeah, yeah I just know everybody. Like sometimes I'll like come across a hot clip and I'll be like, okay, this is good. And then, you know, like this looks hot. And then like the guy's face will appear and it's like Ryan McClain. I'm yeah, like, forget it <laughs> i can't yeah, yeah, yeah. he's such a nice guy I like i can't do it well. occasionally if i ever want to watch porn for fun i'll watch like super amateur stuff where i don't know the people at all 
Yeah. Or um, anime. Um, European porn. There's still a lot of European performers I don't really know. You yeah, know? that's true, but I don't. So, you know, you don't understand cool. what they're saying. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you, you understand the language we all. <laughs> the language of love. Yeah, and sometimes in those European porns, like which I, you know, know from even talking to Steve Holmes and stuff, like, like our locations here are like are like Ben Ine's house. It's like a yeah. some kind of house. Yeah, in, in the valley or whatever. The lo- yeah. the like the lo- fans the locations in Europe. There's like castles like old castles and stuff they get like really like stuff that looks like it should be part of like a real historical site you know yeah no so, i've shot i've shot in prague and budapest and oh, i was okay. quite surprised at like the locations you're that like, i was able to get yeah you're like we could we could shoot here <laughs> like, yeah <laughs> and like the cops don't care you don't have to like get a yeah, right. or like worry about pissing off the neighbors and yeah it's way yeah. easier to shoot in europe so it's it's like fun to watch it's like a real fantasy you're like wow they're shooting like this big crazy spot yeah you know yeah like cobblestone streets and stuff it's rad <laughs> All right, guys, um, we are going to be right back. We're going to ask Joanna some questions from my Patreon members. Oh, and- I love this. Yeah. Fan questions. We have, we have oh, quite so a few. Are we live on Patreon? Uh, no. Oh, okay, no. you asked some questions ahead of time. Okay. Yeah, I asked. Long story, but I can't do live right now okay, because of quarantine. But we will be back. We will be doing live again, I promise people. All right, so hang tight. We will be right back. Adam and Eve is your one-stop shop for everything sexy. Use code HOLLY to get 10 free gifts plus free shipping with any purchase. That's adameve.com. Use code HOLLY for 10 free gifts plus free shipping. Hello, everyone. We are back. So questions from my Patreon members for Joanna. And don't forget, if you join my Patreon at patreon.com slash hollyrandallunfiltered, you will also be able to submit your questions for my guests to answer. Normally I do this in a bonus Q and a section, but I'm actually going to do it as part of the main podcast for all of you today. So everybody can hear her answers. I know very special. Uh, so the first question is from, I don't know how to pronounce this. Mathigis, Mathigis, sorry. Anyways, he asks, in these times of COVID, has Joanna fully embraced her inner nerd and has she started playing Dungeons and Dragons? If so, favorite race and cast, please. Oh my God. I'm, I'm so sorry. I have not started playing Dungeons and Dragons. Um, I have actually tried to play Dungeons and Dragons before and it's, I got to hand it to you. Like it's such a confusing game like I don't know if I have the mental ability I think to play that I don't know I'm smart enough to play Dungeons and Dragons maybe I, maybe that's just it like uh I actually used to you know like the nerd culture and stuff is very was very popular with Burning Angel members so we actually did some a few like Dungeons and Dragons themed uh you know uh, scenes um you know where a few people are playing dungeons and dragons and then they oh play. yeah i did a whole movie for digital playground like that yeah it was a nightmare yeah. yeah yeah so i i when i did those i mean i would i actually remember um xander would be my um my consultant um, of course yeah so i would kind of be like all right and then what happens here and then what, you know he'd always actually be the one in all these scenes too which would make it easier i'd be like now just talk about things Stuff and things, you know, and then you know what I mean. You can carry this conversation, you know. Um, and I even remember then. So when I would write it, I'd be like, "Wait, so how do you like?" I would actually try to do research on how to actually play the game, and um, yeah, that's very, that's a very hard game to play. I I don't know if I can do it. I think it's one of those things you you really have to start when you're younger. I I don't know. Mm If you could, it's like, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. You know, Mm -hmm. I think if you didn't learn it by age, like 15, like, I don't know if your brain can mentally handle it, you know, we got, we got enough going on in our lives. Yeah. 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 We actually, I mean, uh, people are like, Oh, during COVID, you must've had all this time. I'm like, I was actually very, very busy. Yeah. COVID, they were just things I was doing at home, you know, Uh, which I say from a place of, of privilege, you know, I feel blessed that that happened, but, uh, 
um, yeah, I didn't have quite as much um, downtime as. Well, I mean, we're all entrepreneurs, you know, working in this industry. So if you're not getting booked for shoots, you have to find, and you've always like run your own company, had your own brand. So you got to find other ways to, you know, self promote and the porn industry kind of took off a little bit during quarantine. So it did. It did. everybody was pretty busy during quarantine. Yeah. <laughs> So Scott Crouch asks, many have said that porn stars are sexual athletes. What are some common injuries and illnesses that porn stars have to deal with? Any turf toe? I've never heard that phrase before. I don't know what that means. Um, injuries and illnesses. I mean. There's the, there's the AVN flu every year, which is the Sierra oh, turn. Oh, well, there's that. Open. Yes, yes. There's the <laughs> AVN flu every year. That always happens. I mean, you know, you, it's a very physical job, you know, um, you know, for a woman, not to, you know, whatever, like you gotta, you gotta learn how to train your vagina or your asshole to, to, uh, to handle that, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> I remember my, my first year in porn was like a, a never-ending yeast infection <laughs> <laughs> that I got under control. <laughs> yeah, those are the hy hygiene's a big thing, and that's it's a, a tough big thing. Yeah, I just you know, to get a handle on. Uh, you got to get a handle on it. You know, I mean, and I sometimes it's hard because it's like, I don't know why like porn is like this exception. Like I don't like to always talk about some of the things I've gone through because like, like, whereas uh, a, a real, a real, a real athlete can talk about injuries and stuff that happened when they were training and people are like, want to hear about it and they want them to return and they want them to get better. And they'll give them tips on like what to do if you sprain this or you do this, you know? And like, methods and stuff and then you know people always assume like oh well if you you got like something wrong happened to you from porn like then that then you should just blame porn and porn is bad you know mm -hmm. like 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 you know there are certain things that you've got to learn how to do with your body that that maybe don't didn't come naturally to you especially when you're yeah the type of athlete that i am and i just like to conquer everything yeah um, i mean i've never had any major uh injuries you know i i guess i guess my my butthole prolapsed once but it it, re, it returned rather quickly <laughs> it's a very resilient thing it was you no know, you it's so funny i can't tell you how many times joanna like i know that you've given me a lot of tips on anal but i've had so many other people on who've been like when i've asked them like about their anal process they're like well joanna angel taught me <laughs> <laughs> Your name has come up so you're like the guru of anal makes me happy, which is so funny because I I mean I felt like back in the day not a lot of girls did anal. There was like a handful of girls that did yeah. anal. We really, it was a big deal. Now I feel like everybody does anal. Like I feel like there's definitely lots of people in this industry who are much more uh knowledgeable than I am about it at this point. But I, I like to I share know. my knowledge. I really like to help, you know. Everybody always yeah. points back to you as like the ultimate expert. So well, that really means a lot to me. I'm glad I was able to, uh, to, to bestill my knowledge on people <laughs> so they can have good anal sex. But, uh, yeah, illnesses, you know, like, I mean, every once in a while, you know, which hasn't happened to me in a long time, <laughs> you get a, a, a curable STD, <laughs> a flu in your vagina as we go. Yeah. Flu in your vagina. That's a nice way to put it. A flu in your vagina. All right. Next, <laughs> next question. It, it could happen. I mean, it could. It happen. could. It could. Yeah, doesn't well, always yeah. happen. It hasn't happened to me in quite some time. Yeah. It's, it's one of the, you know, there's perks of the job and then there's pitfalls. So yes. I yes. think good with the bad. Yes. Uh, Mark Cunningham um, says, uh, given that Joanna has been a producer director and given that pick of her with those ring lights, I would love to ask some technical questions. What kind of lighting setup would you recommend for the best camming Zoom meeting setup? And also, would you what would you recommend for generic glamour or pinup photography? Um, on a more entertaining note, what kind of catch as you can stories can she tell about learning that technical stuff as she went along? Finally, what was the jankiest camera light setup that ended up working out great? Well, 
geez. I mean, I feel like you'd be able to answer these questions a lot more than I could. (laughs) (laughs) Joanna is a professional director. She focuses on directing the scene and writing an amazing script. And she has people to right. I hire I hire a good lighting guy. <laughs> My lighting advice to you would be to hire Sean. <laughs> yeah, right. But but that was actually, you know, uh something I had to deal with during COVID because I'm so used to having a crew. Yeah. You know, um and I, I was had to really learn how to do a lot of things myself. Mm-hmm. Um but I think I mean I can't give any advice for the professional, you know, pinup photography and stuff like that. I mean, you would, you would obviously know Holly. You should, you should take one of Holly's uh, photography classes if she ever has them. Um, but honestly, just get a a really good, you know, high quality ring light. I mean, especially for just a zoom. I mean, right now I'm just using my window. Um, <laughs> natural light is always the best. At the, I am too. I have a window here and then I have a ring light here for yeah. Phil. But yeah. window light is, is the prettiest light. But it's yeah. basically like, for the most part, for beauty lighting, you want the light like directly right next to the camera to avoid shadows. You want to flush out those shadows and have an even um, look on the face. It, it depends on what you're going after, though. If you're going after a character portrait, you want a hard side light. So, But for beauty lighting, try to keep the light right next to the camera, which is why a ring light is great because it's literally built over the camera. So that like wherever the camera goes, a light goes too. Yeah, just put the cam put the light right behind the computer and you should be yeah. fine. Or to the side. Yeah. I was lazy today, but before this I set this up, I didn't even plug in my ring light, so I'm just oh, counting on the sun. It would probably look a little nicer if I did. <laughs> I, I was like, <laughs> well, I think it's beautiful. Um but yeah, say just ring lights, oh, and then the crappiest, you know. I don't know. I I mean, I remember God way back in the day, my early, early days, we used to buy like, like lights at like Home Depot. You remember those, those like, Oh yeah. Yeah. Those worked great. Those worked great. I remember shooting something way back in the day before I had a professional crew or anything with just like, it was dark and we just used Home Depot lights and it looked awesome. Um, Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if those even exist anymore. Do they? I think ring lights kind of took over those. I mean, the Home Depot lights definitely exist because they're like, you know, if you have to do any kind of construction. construction yeah, they're very yeah. powerful lights, which is yeah. probably why it worked for you. Yeah. Okay. Next question is from Coolio. She says, how old is Joanna if she's willing to share and how does she stay in such great shape? Oh, well, thank you. I'm 40 years old. I just turned 40 in December. Um, Best years of your life. I'm two years years. ahead of you. Um, Thank you, Holly. I I I, uh, admire your uh, positivity. (laughs) Aging in this industry. Um, How do I stay in such good shape? I mean, there's no secret to staying in shape. Like you have to eat healthy and work out. Um, I've actually been a little bit lazier about my workouts. ever since the gym uh, closed down, but um, I'd say, you know, but, but, but for me being lazy means like I maybe skipped a couple days or a week or something. Um, And I don't do anything crazy. Like when you're trying to really lose weight, that's when you have to go crazy. There was a time when I was trying to lose weight and I had to like, I was working out for over an hour a day and I was counting every single calorie. But after I got to a weight I was happy with, and I will go like a couple pounds over, you know, and then I'll try to get back. You got to just make being healthy. Like you can't do like, you can't think of it as a crash diet. You have to find something that will work with your life forever. I mean, I can't do a cheat day anymore. You know, Mm. I can't like binge eat and then like make up for it a week later. Like I just have to like, you know, I found like, it can't feel like dieting and it can't Mm. feel like, like some kind of cramming in workout. Like you got to find a workout routine that works with your life, like realistically, not, you know, don't set unrealistic goals for yourself. You know, um, I tell everyone just get up and do it. Cause if you don't do it in the morning, you're probably never going to want to do it. Like even that's, if you do a 20, 30 minute workout, you know, that's my thing. I, it has to be first thing in the it morning before yeah. I can even think about it. I just put my shoes on. Just I fucking do don't want to do it. You just, even if it's just a quick it. run doing jumping jacks and push ups and pull-ups or jumping jacks and burpees, you know, there's so much you can do at home really yeah. like, you know, um, 
just doing anything where your body is like going crazy for like 20 minutes. Everybody can find 20 minutes in their day, you know? Yeah. And just um, for me, like I've just accepted the fact that I, I truly do despise working out. I don't enjoy it. I don't at all. enjoy it either. Some people are I, like, they're like, Oh, I, you know, like, I like what, yeah. I I've never really got to that point where I'm like, I'm having fun. Like I yeah. hate no, living, never. I I've hate never had gym fun. people and gym culture, you know, like I don't want to make this my, like, my yeah. friendship circle. I want to just do my fucking thing and, and get out yeah. of there. But yeah, uh, you know, just get up, do it for 20 minutes. But it, most of it's diet, unfortunately, because eating yeah. is so much fun. You got to, I like really, I changed my diet so much at a certain point, but you have to get to the point where it doesn't feel like dieting. You need to just like constantly fill your fridge with foods that are good for you and will fill you up. And make you happy. You've got to figure out what desserts. Because if you're a dessert person and you can't live a life without desserts, figure out what desserts will make you, will fill that craving. But also not, you know, whatever. Whether that means eating fruit, whether, I don't know, you find a certain kind of sugar-free, whatever dessert that you really like, just always have that. Like, I am so addicted to carbs. And I don't eat no carbs, but I try to eat lower carbs, you know, than usual. But I always have, like, Aaron will make fun of me. I have, like, 20 different kinds of, like of carb free noodles in my fridge, in my pantry at all times, because like, I just need to have them for when I crave a bowl of pasta. And I, I have found the brands that work for me that get me as close as possible, <laughs> but you need to find those for yourself. Like figure out what foods will satisfy your cravings. Cause you're not going to be, those cravings are not going to like go away, but you can like satisfy them with healthy foods. There's so many options out today. Um, yeah. And, and figure out what works for you, whether that's a meal plan, whether it's just, you know, buying very particular things at the grocery store, whether it's buying like certain things and always stocking them that they have on Amazon or whatever, like it's, that's just what you got to do. Yeah. So true. So true. Okay. Um, we've got, we got one more question, uh, two more questions. Um, Jacob says, what are your recommendations for a good read besides your own book? Obviously. Let's see. Well, of course I will, you know, plug other authors in this industry. Go read a, either of Asa Akira's books if you haven't read them yet. Um, and um, I actually just finished a book um, that was really good. Uh, uh, Supermarket by uh, Logic. Um, not what somebody would probably expect me to say, and it's also not an erotic novel. <laughs> um, but it was a great book. Uh, so I'd recommend you check that out. Um, these are books from a long time ago. Uh, I loved reading, um, Jonathan Ames. If anybody's ever read his books, they're, they're really great. They're very funny and very easy to read. Um, if you want to read erotica, uh, maybe this is cheating because well, I'm in one of them, but the, there is a series called The Best of Women's Erotica. I was in volume five, but they put out a different, um, a different volume every year. It's uh, curated by uh, Rachel Kramer Bussell, uh, Brussel, um, and she does a really good job and she specifically selects uh, different erotic writers and every single volume has a theme. So I think the one that came out this year was all, was like a BDSM theme one. Um, the one that I was in was like, like, I think the theme was like something outrageous, you know, so everybody had to write like an erotic story about something outrageous. And every year, I know there's one that was specifically about threesomes or something. And I would highly recommend the series. Um, I particularly am in volume five, but all the volumes are very good. And um, I read several of them before I started writing because I actually didn't read a ton of erotica. So I wanted to just, and it was a good way for me to read a lot of different kinds of erotica. And then, you mm. know, from that, almost everyone, almost everyone who's in those, those anthologies, um, has written like a whole book too. So you could see which writers you like and then decide which, uh, style, which book like you want to read introduction from. to like a yeah. bunch of different books. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Last question. Uh, Dave W says, uh, do you think the Academy Awards will ever have a separate category just for porn? I want to live to see the day that Joanna gives Holly the lifetime achievement awards at the Academy Awards. You know what, you know what I would go for before I would dream of accepting an Academy Award? Maybe I get an AVN award before that. So like, <laughs> <laughs> I don't get it. Would you like, would you like one of mine, Holly? <laughs> <laughs> Terrible. 
I'll take, I'll take papers. I know he's selling his. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He'll definitely sell his. Are you in the Hall of Fame? You have to be in the Hall of Fame. Not in the no. Hall of Fame. No. I I've, I've literally never, ever, ever won a single AVN award ever. Wow. It's it's fine. I mean, yeah. I, I, I'm yeah. not bitter or anything. <laughs> It's just, uh, that's, it was just kind of a funny, um, a funny question because I was yeah. like, I, I mean, for a while you didn't really make a lot of. Know. You focus mostly on, you know, you're most well known for your photography, and there, I guess there is no award for for photography. No, no, I've won a couple of Expos awards for best photography site, okay. but not for AVN. It's yeah, yeah it's no in a lot for a long time. AVN awards were only for people who did movies that like came out on DVD. Yeah, and, and never, they're still kind of centered towards that. Yeah, and I never part. did that. Yeah. I was always a web based. Like, yeah, director. they have a few like web categories, but those are not. Yeah. it's not nearly as much. Like if you and yeah, unless you're making these like movies. movies yeah. Movies, but. Yeah. You're doing uh, just fine, Holly. You would be. A, you, you know, know what? It's it's. I'm okay with it. Yeah. Um, I can pay my bills with money that I make. You can from pay your bills with money, and my, you also my very. Shoes. You are very good at your craft. I think everybody everybody but knows that. Yeah. Whatever. Anyways, about uh, the Academy so Awards. No, it's pretty there's, there's not going to be a day where there's a porn category at the no. at the Academy, and you know what? I don't want there to be. Am I the yeah. only one that like? I feel like people are always fighting, you know, or a lot of these very pro sex worker podcasts and, and, um, and media, they, they're always fighting the stigma against porn. And like, I think part of the stigma, like makes us who we are, you know, mm. like I, part of what drew me to this industry in the first place is I liked that it was wrong and that it was frowned upon. And like, I don't know. Um, and I think that stigma also worked to our benefit back in the day, you know, like it, it made it, uh, more that, you know, the more taboo and the more like in the dark people were about this industry. I think people were more like enamored by it at the same rate, you know, like my mom always complains. She's like, you know, I always made the most amount of money when porn was illegal. Cause my parents shoot right. porn. When it was illegal yeah. and, she was like, and then it became a, legal like every like tom dick and harry was in the mm -hmm. porn industry she was like it was much more fun when it was illegal so i mean I, i've seen a change over the years you know yeah um, i remember early um conventions and it's like the fans that were there they like they worshipped you they really worshipped you because you were like this First of all, without social media, like they didn't, they never heard you speak, never heard you talk. The only places they saw you was like in a movie that they paid mm -hmm. for and they jerked off to, you know, and like they were diehard fans. And then I feel like as porn became more and more acceptable over the years, you get people that were just like, oh, cool, there's a porn convention. I want to go. Like, and they're not even really porn fans or like they, yeah. they just like just want to like talk to you about i don't know anything and everything. yeah like like it's almost like some of the the level of like glamour or something went away uh, yeah you're not like this this unattainable um thing like, yeah star anymore yeah. which in a way is also good because that's you know why platforms like only fans and such are it's doing true. So well. yeah. that personal connection that people feel that they can have with you but yeah there is something the mystique of like the porn star has gone out the window i have no desire to go to the academy awards you know i i see the cost of those dresses that those women wear and i don't i don't want to go i can't spend thirty thousand dollars on a dress I, I i wouldn't have anything to wear it's I'm funny i'm just thinking about it so you see sometimes as women uh, show up and they like are wearing such expensive jewelry that they have like bodyguards. I know, I know. Did you ever see that? What is it? Ocean's Twelve, the one, the the women one. The, the, the I haven't seen one. that one, but it's, I know it's all it. about that. Like her wearing this piece of jewelry to the Met Gala, and and there's yeah. like a jewelry heist to steal it, and it was like it showed all the layers of security you need yeah. just to wear a stupid fucking necklace, and it's like. It was, it's crazy. And I know most of that was, you know, based, obviously it's a movie, you know, but a lot of that was based on, on truth. And it just seems so uh, absurd to me. So, yeah. So I'd rather stay home and watch the Academy Awards and be able to sit back 
and like say whatever comments I want about everyone who goes on stage in my pajamas. I will also say too, the Academy Awards are terribly long. I mean, you so think long. the AVN Awards are long? The thing with the Academy Awards is that they actually everybody comes up on stage for every single category. Yeah, like the <laughs> Awards, they don't do that to you. They only like have the major ones people come up, but for like you know best editing, like no one cares oh, about that. They're having these teams of like the the third sound technician come on stage yeah. <laughs> and yeah. you're just like you're like come on me. bring brad pitt back on stage who is this guy <laughs> this is a little bit off topic but have, did you ever watch that documentary on the guys who make south park i i haven't seen it oh I should, okay I so love, i love south park so much i really love yeah it. me too okay so two so careers so matt and trey right so do you remember when they went to the Academy Awards dressed as Gwyneth Paltrow and J-Lo? Oh my God, I don't remember. What year was that? What? I, I guess I must have missed that. This was a long time ago. Okay. Do you remember when, when Gwyneth Paltrow wore that like that pink dress, that pink like ball ground dress, which was like a big deal, whatever. And then J-Lo wore that scandalous green dress with like the slit, like all the way up to her vagina. And it was so yeah, revealing, yeah. It was this big thing. So, so basically- they wore those clothes to the Academy Awards, right? So awesome. And they dropped acid before oh, they went. So awesome. They're so the acid hits them on the red carpet and they're being interviewed oh, so at, like good. good morning in America or something like that. And you can see, I don't remember if it was Matt or Trey, but you can see the acid hit him. And he talks about it in the documentary. And you see the acid hit him and his eyes like roll back in his head, like while he's in the middle of this interview. And the funniest so thing bad. that they said was that like it was such a terrible idea because the problem is it's not only like the Academy Awards were long, but the red carpet is like hours long, There's, right? Oh, hours. I can only imagine. Hours long. How so by the time he's like, so what happened? He was like, by the time we like got seated and like the Academy Awards was like, you know, going, going through, we were coming down. He's like, there's nothing oh worth coming God. down off of acid and being stuck oh at the Academy God. Awards at like an eight hour show. They said it was torture. That sounds like, like a literal nightmare. Yeah. Um, that's really. So whenever I think of the Academy stuff. Awards, I just think of that story. Right. And I, like, guess, uh, I guess, I guess I could go like that, but you know, I could, I don't think I could yeah. do acid. It's too long. Yeah. Anyways, those are all of our questions. Joanna, thank you those so much. Fun questions. Fun. Yeah. yeah, they were good. They were good. Thank you, um, Molly. Thank you. It's always good to see you. Um, good to see you too. One day I'll see you in person. Um, I'll see your husband in person next yeah, week. I think, yeah, I guess you will be. Uh, yeah, I'm shooting him. him you know? Yeah, a little special project for browsers. Very exciting. I don't know how much I'm allowed to say about it yet, but um, so I won't, but so it's going to be yeah. Oh, I'm excited for you. I'm sure it's going to yeah. be amazing. Oh, I hope. Yeah. I hope to be on your set one day in the near future. It's going to happen. I'm sure, I'll wind up there somehow with my new it's titties. Gonna... Yeah. My new titties. Can you tell everybody uh, where they can find you online and also where they can uh, purchase your book? Um, everyone, uh, you can find me if you want to get dirty with me. Go to my OnlyFans, OnlyFans.com. Slash Joanna Angel. My name on Instagram is Joanna Angel. My name on Twitter is Joanna Angel. They are both verified accounts. Please don't talk to a fake Joanna Angel. And um, you know you can purchase my book just about uh, everywhere books are sold. But um, probably the most common, easy thing for you to do is go on Amazon and buy it. It's available and it will ship immediately. So um, look for Club Forty Two by Joanna Angel, and that is my book. And please, please buy it. And if you buy it. Tell me what you thought. Tweet at me or hit me up on Instagram and I'd love to know your thoughts. Fantastic. And you guys can follow me at Holly Randall on Instagram and on Twitter. Of course, if you want to support this podcast and submit your questions, like the ones that I just asked Joanna, you can do that at my Patreon, Holly Randall Unfiltered, patreon.com slash Holly Randall Unfiltered. And um, thank you so much for listening. Joanna, again, thank you for coming. And I will see you guys next week. Thank you.